Welcome to Online Off Script, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Eliza Philo, Digital Ads Senior Coordinator. And I'm Mira McNitt, the Senior Social Media Director. So this week, we're talking about cracking the code and unveiling the strategies behind successful influencer campaigns in 2024, plus some tips on how to leverage micro-influencers for maximum effect. Our guest today is Esther Kim, founder and CEO of Maven Reach, a female-owned, female-run, affordable, full-service influencer marketing agency. Maven Reach specializes in seeding and gifting campaigns for the world's leading consumer brands, such as Jack Daniels, Gentleman Jack, Botanic Tonics, New Wave, and more. Thanks for joining us, Esther. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me today. Awesome. Yeah, we're excited to have you on the podcast. I think before we get started, it would be good to give our listeners just a little bit of information into who you are and then maybe also into what micro influencers are if some of our listeners aren't necessarily sure what constitutes that. Sure. So a little background on me. I am a Korean American and I was born and raised in LA. And I am the founder of Maven Reach, which is a influencer marketing agency. And I'm very proud that it's female founded. Um, it is female run. All my employees are female. Um, and it's interesting how I got here. I mean, I influencer marketing wasn't around when I was younger. So I started my career in market research. So really data driven insights. Found that a little too dry for my taste and then moved into a whole slew of jobs, right? account manager, customer success manager, sales. I even had an Amazon, an Amazon FBA. I was doing a bunch of stuff, Etsy. And once COVID hit, I wanted to be able to travel while working and thought it was the perfect opportunity to start my own company. And it's been a wild ride since. All right. And to answer your second question, well, actually, I think Mira would probably be better at answering this question since she is an micro-influencer herself, but just to uh, talk about micro-influencer, oh, just influencer marketing in general, I think micro is the new macro. I think time and time again, our client, my clients are experiencing that smaller people with smaller followings, just it feeds into higher engagement and trust and their audience is more likely to buy when they feel a personal connection with that influencer. Everyone I follow, they're all my girlfriends. <laughs> They don't know me, but we're friends. And I think with micro influencers specifically, it's really about quality over quantity. Um, so yeah, Mira, you feel free to jump in. You're an actual micro influencer. Would love to hear more about your experience on that side of the front. Yeah. For anyone wondering what the difference between like a micro and a macro or like a full-size influencer are, it's the amount of followers that you have. Everyone's like numbers change, but so you can have like a nano influencer, which I think is typically up to what, 10K? I don't know if like the goalpost has moved 10 to like, I would even say up to like a hundred thousand is micro and like anything over that you're kind of into like a traditional influencer space. So my friends love to be like, Oh my God, you're an influencer. And I'm like, I have 32,000 followers. I am a micro influencer, but it's nice because people know that I'm not making my living off of being an influencer. So whenever I have a recommendation, it's, it's my recommendation. It's not that dove soaps came to me with a campaign and they're paying me ten thousand dollars and i'm that one video paid my rent yeah and so it's just it's all about the trust and i think that businesses that keep going to the alex earls of the world are missing out and especially there's this thing on tiktok where people are just they're just your girlfriend posting tiktok talking to you and then they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow from micro influencer to a full-fledged influencer and they move to la and they become a different person and then everyone starts unfollowing them or blocking them and doesn't want anything to do with them anymore because they're not the relatable everyday person that they were. And I think that's kind of like the full point of a micro influencer is they're, they're just some person, just me, that just is comfortable in front of the camera. Absolutely. And I wanted to jump in here. So I think from, from a brand's perspective, like what is the power of micro influencer marketing specifically? I would say if you're a brand, um, one, like I mentioned the higher engagement, but two, Mira mentioned there, these influencers, there are no gatekeepers, right? They're not being, um, they don't have an agency or an, a manager kind of upselling their services. Um, so from a brand's perspective, you know, when you do see content go viral or where you, where you do think there might be a good fit in terms of a long-term collaboration, when you follow up with a micro influencer, they're generally very excited. <laughs> they're 
you know, when you're, they're flattered um, and I feel it's more of a collaborative environment where when it comes to macro creators, it's very transactional. Here's my media kit. This is my rate. I'm not taking anything below, I don't know, 10 grand per reel. With micro influencers, there's a lot of nuance. You can work together and be like, hey, you know, this product is $700. Would you be open to doing a product exchange first? If the content does well, happy to pay and partner with you the second time because you've proven yourself. So from a brand's perspective, there's a lot more flexibility when it comes to micro influencers. Yeah. You, you've touched on thus far a lot of the pros, um, but I'm wondering if there's some that you haven't mentioned yet, just from a brand's perspective and maybe from um, more of that micro content creator's perspective as well, what are the benefits of that partnership? The benefits, well, one, it's way more budget friendly from a brand's perspective. Um, they get to test the waters before fully committing to the long-term collaboration. I have macro creators reaching out to me and they're all to six months to annual contracts. Why, why would a brand, it's really tough for a brand to opt into that or the engagement rate is, it doesn't really translate to sales. With micro influencers, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the theory of 1,000 true fans. They actually move the needle in terms of sales. So there's a there's a theory called I don't I'm probably going to butcher it, but 1,000 true fans essentially if that's all you, uh, an influencer or a person in power needs to make a change in terms of revenue or change in society, 1,000 true fans, people who actually listen to you and make purchasing decisions uh, based on your recommendations. Honestly, at the macro level, it gets a little diluted. So there's not, I've had a client pay $100,000 to one macro creator. They partnered for a year and they didn't make one sale. Oh. One sale. I think it was amazing for brand awareness, very top of funnel. But at the end of the day, brands don't care about like reach and impressions. They're really looking at sales. So with micro influencers, like you do see the snowball effect of, okay, there's two sales here and then next month there's four sales there. And then I, we can talk about this. And I know this is one, like one of the uh, paints that I'm most proud of is with Lunia. We drove $85,000 in revenue for them over a course of seven months or seven to eight months. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day for a brand, what they're really caring about is driving sales. How many influencers did you work with for that campaign? And like what size were that? Great question. So our, at Maven Reach, we have a different strategy. I know other agencies out there might promise a client, hey, we can solidify 10 influencers or 20 or 30. We kind of approach it from a casting a wide fishnet approach where we reach out to 350, excuse me, 350 unique micro influencers per month. We align on the target demo with the, with the brands and say, okay, are they women? What age are they? Where are they regionally located? Based on that and like their niche, we will email 350 unique micro influencers month over month and people are bound to opt in, right? We're going to find someone. It's a numbers game at this point. Um, so the people who do follow up, one, they're genuinely interested in what you're offering. Obviously, there are times where, you know, you have influencers who are looking for free product, but even in that case, you're introducing your product to them and if they love it, they'll post about it. If they don't, no harm, no foul. So for Lunia, we we had partnered again with them for about eight, at that point, seven, six to seven months. So we are reaching out to 350 unique influencers month over month. But out of that, we found 176 core influencers who were really moving the needle in terms of driving sales. So we invited them to a brand ambassador type of platform. Um, and then what initially started as a product seeding campaign, we expanded the scope of work because we were honestly, just really aligned with who we're targeting going after that we expanded the scope to like fully building out their affiliate program, sourcing influencers, shipping product, staying in contact with all of them month over month so that the brand has a continuous cadence of content month over month. You said one of our buzzwords here, which was seeding. So yes. what is seeding or gifting campaigns and what are the benefits and the drawbacks? Yes. Great question. So product seeding, to put it simply, is your you're sending free product to creators, affiliates, customers, whoever it is, in the sense of influencer marketing, it'd be creators with the intention of building relationships or getting product feedback or getting content. For lower price point items, I would personally recommend a no strings attached approach. You really wanna think like an influencer, right? Like 
if I'm an influencer and a brand reaches out, a brand I've never heard of is selling chapstick and I'm have like 10 other brands that are offering a bed frame, a desk, like, obviously I'm not really going to be interested in the chapstick. If they're requiring, Hey, I'm going to send you this chapstick. If you post about it, no, man, like it's $2. If I like it, I'll post about it, but I don't want to be contract obligated uh, to post about it. So that's my recommendation there for products with a higher perceived value. Going back to my original example of the $700 HEPA air filter. Brands aren't just going to give that away willy nilly to everyone that asks. So in those cases, we can negotiate requiring content in exchange for product. And we do product seeding because it gives us the opportunity to work with a wide range of influencers um, and we can test who's driving engagement. And from there we can, you know, pinpoint, okay, here are the champions who are authentically championing our brand and then dedicate resources to building relationships with those when it comes to paid collaborations. Look, as an agency, I'm kind of that middleman, right? Brands are like, oh, influencers are so expensive. I don't want to pay them. Influencers are like, fuck you, pay me. Like there's that whole movement. So I don't know if I can cuss, but F you pay me. Um, so I'm in that, I'm that middleman where I have to find a happy medium where the brand is happy and the influencer is happy. And with product seeding, it's a nice way, the no strings attached approach to kind of meet in the middle. And then based on the performance of, of the influencer, the brand can then decide, okay, a paid collaboration is something we're willing to invest in. I have so many questions about tracking. Like how, what does tracking look like for you? And I feel like a lot of these actions take place not on platforms necessarily that you're you're tracking their actions specifically. Like what does that look like for you all? And ooh, Mira, I'm going to give you some, some <laughs> dirty secrets. From, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, from the brand's perspective, I it's tough because I want to give insight from like, what brands want from influencers specifically. And this episode, I want to advise brands on what recommendations and like what not to do. But to answer your question, how do we track everything? So we have software that scrapes, there's a bunch of software out there. We use one platform and it scrapes hashtags. It scrapes media based on hashtags and mentions. Then it, it aggregates all the influencers and the media. So a camp, it'll show kind of a grid of everyone. We can sort it based on highest engagement, most views, and you can see the engagement rate of the post versus the influencer's average engagement rate. So that's a metric that we use. We do have a client dash. So all of our clients have a client dashboard that not only scrapes the media, so there's like a media tab, but there is a, a dashboard. It's almost a bird's eye view of where the campaign is at any given moment. That includes number of influencers, reach, impressions, media value, we can integrate it with Shopify. So you can see the click-through rate. We can connect Shopify promotion code. So the brand can see the exact dollar amount that each influencer is generating. So there's a lot of ways to track it. Um, but I think the most important, if you are a brand that's pretty new to, um, and just launched, you have a couple hundred or thousand followers on Instagram, then I would recommend, you know, using, really looking at impressions and reach. Whereas if, for Lunia, they were pretty established. They took off during COVID. So if you're a pretty established brand, what they're really tracking is sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say the drawbacks of product seeding, right? So influencer marketing is a huge umbrella. Product seeding is just one, one strategy that our agency really focuses on. I would say specifically with product seeding, one drawback that a lot of my clients get a little bit nervous about when we first sign them on is timing. So we require a three month minimum, the retainer. We've tried one month, we've tried two months, but it honestly doesn't work. Like you won't see the fruits of your labor at two months. Month three, just due to the nature of product seeding, you know, first month is onboarding, aligning with influencers, outreach. Month two is where we begin shipping product. Influencers are busy. Like Mira mentioned, like this is not her full-time job. So she might receive a, some might be traveling. You'll send a package in one week and then three weeks later, four weeks later, six weeks later, the influencer opens it up and they're like, oh my God, I love it. Um, so you can see media posted. Like sometimes we've had, we've even had one influencer, not the greatest example, but six months later, she's like, oh my God, I love this product. And I'm like, oh, I wish you would have posted earlier because they're no longer a client. So I would say that's the drawback. Like you, 
Influencer marketing is, is definitely a long-term investment. Brands, I'm telling you, patience is key. Quick wins are rare. Like, yes, we would all love a viral video, but one, viral videos don't really, don't really mean sales. And I would personally give it, you know, three to six months for meaningful results because building relationships take time. I'll also say that like my videos that go viral are so non-promotional. I can make a TikTok about a book that I loved and it might only get 5,000 views, but I get at least 20 comments of people being like, I just went and bought it, just got it on Kindle, I want it. Versus my video that has a million views right now that's still going. It's just me complaining about something. So it's <laughs> the, the substantial content usually isn't the stuff that goes viral, but when I go viral, people are going to come back to my page and then they're totally. going to see the substantial content. So like, that's the value there. And whenever brands, we want our product to go viral. I'm like, okay, well, that's not really the point of that can't. video. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and like, people aren't going to, unless it's someone being like this cleared, th mm -hmm. like this solved this big problem. Most of the time, no one's going to be leaving, sharing, commenting, adding virality to something that's just like promoting something. Totally. And a note on viral videos. So when, so as an agency, it's our responsibility to follow up with those creators, right? Like we've, okay, we found our person. So what's next? It's so interesting because influencers always share how shocked they, they are when a video goes viral. It's always the video that they spent the least time working on. They're like, okay, this video I poured my heart and soul into has the least amount of views. But I think that just goes to show that people are really looking for authenticity, right? Influencer marketing. I remember, I mean, to this day, I like clean talk. Like I buy everything that influencers recommend. And you can tell when someone is like pushing a product, but when someone it's like truly authentic and you feel like they're not selling you something, they're like, oh, it's almost like that big sister vibe. This worked for me, it's gonna work for you. Those are the videos that actually drive sales. Truly, and like when I tell you that the video that I have that has 1.2 million views, I didn't think I was gonna post it. I literally was sitting here working. I saw a video that made me mad. I recorded myself just talking to my phone, complaining about it. And I was like, do I really wanna post this? Within three hours, I had over 500,000 views. Like it like went crazy. And it's always that stuff that you're like, this is what you guys wanted from me. Like This mm -hmm. is what you like. But like, like that thing about like it being the big sister recommending, I literally have glass straws because yeah. there was this girl who was like, I found the perfect 2 p.m. Diet Coke recipe. Here's what I do. And she was like, the glass straw makes it. And I was like, well, I need glass straws. And she wasn't sponsored by big glass straw. Exactly. She didn't have an affiliate. She wasn't like, go shop it in my Amazon. She was just like, here's everything that I do. And I was like, well, I need to do that to have this satisfied experience. Yes. And actually to add some numbers, some data behind this. So it's interesting. I always tell my client, you know, 93% of consumers find UGC helpful when making purchasing decisions, right? We're visual creatures. And it's fascinating because there's a stat. Let me, let me read this here. The UGC is nine times more impactful than macro influencer content and delivers a 28% higher engagement rate on social. And I mean, the numbers are not like, it, that's not the important thing. I mean, Mira, I think you can attest to this, like on the brand's end, we can attest to this as well. Yes, they can do paid ads and there's a, there's a time and place for performance marketing, but UGC again is really every like, items sell out on Amazon and TikTok shop because of word of mouth. And again, going just back to that word, authenticity, it's, it's really key. Don't know if y'all are on TikTok, Croc boots, croots. Those are my no. latest thing <laughs> that I was influenced to. I ended up not buying them because they were sold out. And yeah. it wasn't even that there wasn't a big influencer campaign is literally just girls being like, I bought these and they're so ugly, but look, I'm not slipping or I bought them and they're so warm and they're not as bad as I thought they were going to be. And like one of my friends, it was a video with like 500 likes showed up on her for you page. She sent it to me because I am the queen of Crocs of my <laughs> friend. And I was like, just, and then, you know, TikTok is a search engine. Now people are using it to verify purchases. So I went through and I was looking at all these people in their croots. And I was like, I need a pair, but they were sold out in my size. But on the flip side of that, there was this room freshener that I was thinking of buying. I can't remember the brand, but it was like on Amazon, it was $50 for two containers and then the gel that's like an odor eliminator. And I was like, this is a big purchase. I don't know how I feel about it. I tried searching on TikTok. Every single video was a gifted or partnered campaign. Mm. And I was like, 
there's no real opinions. I, I don't know if this is going to be any good. So I ended up not buying it and just going back to my like $3 target one. Exactly. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to jump in right there. So because you saw that it was sponsored, it almost turned you off. Right. And I feel the same way. I'm like, do I trust what you're saying right now, which is why, again, going back to the strategy I mentioned before, the no strings attached approach, you, when you do a no strings attached approach, the brand isn't legally required, um, or the influencer actually also isn't legally required to say sponsored gift, you know, they can, they can say, oh, this was gifted to me, but like, these are my honest opinions, which I see all the time. Um, But even that difference of saying gifted and when influencers share constructive feedback, but still say like, I still love the product. Um, yeah, it's, that's what the brand, that's the goal. If I could even, my, my viral video is about reviewing books and everyone's talking about, there's people in my comments saying, if I only see someone giving products five stars or books, five stars, I don't trust their reviews. If you don't have that criticism in it, which you're more likely to get with a micro influencer as opposed to a macro influencer is the the willingness to critique a product because again they're everyday people if they don't come with those critiques this is it's a lie it feels a lie yeah absolutely and I know brands are hesitant to like let people say bad things about it but like everything has a flaw absolutely yeah. how do you in- oh yeah I was gonna say, how do you deal with brands whenever an influencer posts something negative or whatever? I was just, I was just about to touch on this. So it's interesting. I would say 95, 96, no, 96% of influencers are very respectful. And if they have constructive feedback, they will email us first. They will say, Hey, I don't want to like just bash you guys. I know you guys went out of your way to ship me this. Um, I'm still genuinely interested in this product, but the packaging, it's too hard to open. The bag was open um, when I received it. Um, We work with a hair extensions company. Oh, like there were, there were knots when I got it. There were not perfect people. Like things happen as products get shipped. And I think influencers understand that and give the brand the benefit of the doubt. I think when you see negative, like criticism online, it's usually, I I would guarantee the influencer did their due diligence of sharing that feedback with the brand and either one, the brand didn't respond or two, they didn't like how the brand responded. So now they're like, okay, it's a free for all. Like I feel justice. I'm going to, I'm going to say my, what I feel. Um, So for any brands out there that are thinking about doing influencer marketing, like, I know it's scary. I know you're like so big and like it, there's so much, it's time consuming and, Um, It's a little scary because you can get, you know, negative feedback. That is just a sliver of how much value it could drive for your brand, not just in terms of like awareness, but also in revenue. So give it a try. I think the the biggest mistake brands make when with influencer marketing is one, just not even trying um, because they're like, oh, we're gonna do that next year. We're gonna do that next year. Let's just focus on performance marketing. But yeah, there, there is real value in influencer marketing. Yeah. Where do you see it going in the next 12 to 36 months, the next couple of years, do you see big changes on the horizon? Do you think this will move into like kind of a new arena somehow? I think video content will still remain king. I And short form content is going to be more popular. Everyone's attention span is getting shorter and shorter, but I would also say authenticity i know i keep saying authenticity but it's because like literally every influencer looks the same it's like have you guys seen that like a hashtag sad beige house or whatever like all of all influencers white furniture white walls white cushions i'm like one how does anyone live in this like sterile environment but two like everyone has the stanley everyone has like clean girl makeup everyone you know what i mean like what an influencer looks like in your head so i think over the next 12 to 36 months we're, what I'm starting to notice is I'm unfollowing the Amazon storefront Stanley Cup girls for quirky, weird ass influencers who are like, this is art that I made. And it's like a duck made out of Play-Doh. And I'm like, I don't know why, but like, I like that. It like inspires me to be different and like celebrates being different. So I think as, I think a lot of people are getting annoyed of just seeing the same content over and over and the trend creators will literally take the same audio or the same verbiage of creators used before and just act it out themselves. And this is like my biggest pet peeve, like have a point of view. Um, 
And so with influencers, I think just be yourself. Like there's already, there's no one else you out there. Um, brands are looking for people that are different and you can only be you. So just be you. Like don't try to fit into all these trends. In terms of the brand side, I think we're going to see TikTok shop. I mean, it's already taking off, but TikTok shop right now kind of seems like wild, wild west. It almost feels like Amazon back in the heyday. I used to sell on Amazon. It's like people are buying reviews. Like it just, a product can go viral. So I think for brands, especially brands that have products that are priced under $20, $20 um, really leverage open collaborations, target collaborations, really leverage the ad your platform. Like TikTok, I think TikTok at one point was covering 30% of the product cost and 30% of the commission for the creator. So they're basically just printing money for brands to be like, please sell on this platform. So I think TikTok shop is going to start to blow up over the next couple of, of years. Do you have any campaigns currently that are using TikTok shop? Because I, my for you page is full of people being like, I'm over it. I'm tired of it. Get it off my page. So are you doing anything with it? Are you seeing success? Yes. So great question. Yes, we are. I mean, it's interesting. I think from a consumer standpoint, I'm with you. Like, I don't, I don't want to be consistently sold something and like have products shoved down my throat. Um, but yes, a lot of my clients are on TikTok shop. For any brands out there, I would say the biggest, I have certain prospects that come to me and say like, I can't, it's taking forever to get approved on TikTok shop. And a trick that I learned is your business address for your initial application has to match the business address that you have on your EIN. That's tied to your EIN. So there's a little tip there. And then with TikTok shop, I think it's just the future. So it's almost like a necessary evil. Brands are going to have to be on there if they already have a TikTok. But I'm curious to hear your perspective because I'm a millennial. I personally only shop, shop on Amazon, but what we've been hearing and what we've seen from the demographics is the Gen Z is just like adding to car and just checking out and just kind of testing the waters um, when it comes to products that are priced under like that $25 price point. I have like not purchased anything on TikTok shop period because I'm like adamantly annoyed by it. Yeah. Um, because I feel like there's a lack of authenticity specific specifically because of that time where TikTok was just like handing out money. People yep. were just buying stupid products and just promoting them to get, they were like, got this, the beach waiver, the hair beach waiver was <laughs> everywhere. And I was like, oh, and the away. <laughs> yes. And I got these and I'm like, I don't care. This doesn't have anything to do with me. So like maybe if TikTok got better, like showing things that are relevant to me, I might be more yes. willing to do it. But like, I'm so not interested in like supporting this thing that's annoying me right now. And then also I'm a big like researcher into the price of something. And like, especially I'll like see something for sale on TikTok shop and I'll be like, is this a drop shipping ripoff? And so then mm -hmm. I go search it online and I'll be like, oh, it's on Alibaba or something. And I'm a, a zillennial. So I'm like, right in this middle space <laughs> of like distrust of the internet, but still early adaptation. Yeah. So I'd like, I do a lot of research before I'll commit to something, but uh, Eliza, are you on TikTok? Are you seeing this? I am on TikTok. I would say I think I'm an outlier of all my friends because I'm constantly hearing my friends view. I bought this on TikTok. I bought this on TikTok. I bought this on TikTok. So in my age group, I'm 25. So I feel like in my age group, a lot of my friends are actually finding products and purchasing them from TikTok. Yeah, that's funny. but I the platform probably has some ways to go in terms of algorithm. Oh yeah, and it's still in its early days. <laughs> yeah, it needs to mature. But what were you gonna say, Mira? Sucker for Instagram Shop though. The amount of times yes. that I get an ad on Instagram and I'm like, and I got all my checkout information loaded in there. I'm buying it, no questions, no research. And I think it's just because they're yeah. better at like, matching well, their algorithm. I'm like, yeah. they know what I need. They're like, you need exactly. this jacket. I'm like, I did need that jacket. Totally. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think that is the future of TikTok shop. Like it only launched a couple of months ago. They're still like figuring it out. Uh, the search bar in TikTok is terrible. Like even when I'm searching for my client's official TikTok, it doesn't come up. 
I'm like, what is happening here? The fact that TikTok shop is only available on mobile, it's not available on, on desktop. Hello, there are people working from a computer who need to look like, pretend like they're working. So like little things that I think they're going to be huge leaps when it comes to targeting. So I'm really excited to see how it goes because I do think like I, I do honestly all of my shopping on TikTok, like Amazon storefronts, like I will click on it. It'll link up in Instagram. I'll check out with it within the Instagram app, you know? So I don't know. I, I do think that's the future. Um, and I'm really excited because that it almost with TikTok shop kind of being the wild odd west right now, it almost le- um, evens out the playing field for these brands that are a bit smaller. Maybe they're newer to the game, newer to the market. So it's exciting for if you're a new brand, like I would 100% recommend getting on TikTok shop now because um, I took a screenshot for one of my clients actually on TikTok shop and the platform completely changed from that screenshot three weeks ago. Like they are updating it every day. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. I will say I joined TikTok in January, 2019, ahead of the curve. They are the best platform at listening to its users and making changes. So absolutely. All these things people are complaining about, I wouldn't be surprised. I said, if in like six months, TikTok shop is not annoying, it's serving me the right products, it's an yep. easy checkout process, all of that, because they are constantly adapting. Okay. Ooh. No, go ahead, Eliza. I'm just, I'm curious if there's any campaign specifically that you felt like throughout the time that you've run this company that have like really blown it out of the water and like what strategies were you using in those scenarios? And maybe you already yeah. touched on this, but. Yeah, no, no, no. So yeah, it was the example that I brought up with Lunia. So L-U-N-Y-A, they're a luxury woman's restwear company. And they really took off during COVID because they, I mean, women were working at home, but they needed to look professional on Zoom while feeling comfortable. So yeah, I'm really proud of that campaign because the initial scope of work was product seeding, right? The reaching out to 350 unique micro-influencers per month. We give them a promo code see how many sales they generate, scrape all media, all of that. I think we did a really good job of aligning on exactly who we were targeting, not just lifestyle, their elegant, elevated lifestyle, you know, chic, you know? So because we targeted the right influencers month over month, we had like, we were almost overwhelmed with the amount of influencers that were opting into the campaign. So we actually had to move them into a like, create a brand ambassador program where okay, let's send them one thing every month. Let's give them like commission tiers so that like they're working towards 10% commission, 15, 20. Then you have like, then we say, okay, who are our core, like core influencers that are driving sales? I think I mentioned, you know, we drove 85K in revenue for them. I think two or three influencers were a majority of that pie that drove like, 75% of that revenue. So again, it's really finding like these key influencers and you won't find them unless you test it, unless you're reaching out. It's kind of, you mentioned like you almost didn't post that viral video, the video that went viral. You have to like, it's almost the universe rewards action and keep showing up over and over again. And then it, you'll get a bullseye over time. It's going to happen. Exactly. Especially I find like maybe every once every three months, I have a video go viral and like, that's a pretty good rate. And like, you just have to keep posting to make that happen. Try again. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. Well, towards the end of the podcast, we always like to give our guests an opportunity to plug themselves. So if you want to let our listeners know where they can find you and anything else you want to call out. Stage is yours. Awesome. So again, my name is Esther Kim. I am the co-founder of Maven Reach, and we are a low-cost influencer marketing agency that connects consumer brands with a wide range of creators. Our success is really built on the philosophy of giving and not asking. And that's just a way, fancy way to say that our bread and butter is product seeding and TikTok shop management. Essentially, we help reduce brands, reduce the time um, and resources that they use by over 85%. So if you guys have need any help or support in terms of strategy, in terms of execution, I think influencer marketing 
it just takes a lot of time and we want to help take that off your plate. So you can find more information or how to contact us at Maven Reach. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. I've yes, so it was great. Yeah, I'm happy to do another episode some down the line if you guys want to chat. There is so much to talk about influencer marketing. So yeah, if you guys so want to talk more, happy to do it. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic.